True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Audrey Marie Hilly killed her husband, Frank, in 1975 and attempted to kill her daughter, Carol, three years later. Her choice of victims, which also probably included her mother and mother-in-law, were the people who were close to her. Her motive was money. What makes her case extraordinary is how she managed to elude arrest for three years while on the run as a fugitive, and then, while serving a 20-year-to-life sentence, she managed to obtain a prison furlough and disappeared into the woods of Alabama. Her story begins in May 1975 when Frank Hilly visited his doctor, complaining of nausea and pain in his abdomen. His doctor diagnosed a viral stomach ache. The condition persisted and Frank was admitted to a hospital for tests, which indicated liver malfunction. Physicians then diagnosed him with infectious hepatitis. Because the symptoms really closely resembled those of hepatitis, no tests for poison were conducted. After he died, the cause of death was listed as hepatitis. Frank had a life insurance policy that Audrey cashed in for $31,000, which would be about $150,000 in 2018. Slightly over three years later, Audrey took out a $25,000 life insurance policy on her own daughter, Carol. Within a few months, Carol began to experience nausea and was admitted to the emergency room several times. A year after insuring her daughter, Audrey gave Carol an injection, telling her that it would help her with nausea, but her symptoms got a lot worse. Audrey Marie Hilly was arrested for the murder of her husband and the attempted murder of her daughter, Carol. But what if Carol had died? Would Audrey Marie have continued killing family members? All signs point to yes. Today's quiet end discussion, Poisonous, covers the twisted life and outrageous crimes of a woman who appeared to be a normal 1960s housewife. Audrey Marie Hilly kept a home. She raised her children And she just happened to commit murder when she was short on funds. What have we got for a beer today? We got a nice Alabama beer called El Gordo, brewed by Good People Brewing Company in Birmingham. It's a Russian imperial stout. Yeah. I know. I'm not surprised. A good summer beer. Yeah. So it's like most of these guys, it's black, but it, it has a huge dark tan head. Very nice looking one. Aroma is very good, chocolate, coffee, and molasses. And the taste is even better. Because we got a couple of different kinds of chocolate. I got some dark chocolate, like some bittersweet stuff, and some cocoa, a little sweeter chocolate, and the coffee. It's a medium bodied beer, sipping beer, fairly high alcohol volume. So sit back, go slow, and enjoy. All right, sounds good. Well, let's open it up and try it. Down to the quiet end. So it's only in the 70s today, so a lot of people outside, it's what they call a chilly day in Las Cruces. Yes, it's yes. Win- winter. <laughs> That's right. It's maybe, fall is upon us almost. It's getting there. It's the end of is. August. It is. And maybe we'll see those cool people at the quiet end, the biker and his wife. I hope so. That'd be nice. They had some great stories. I always love a good story. And speaking of stories, why don't you start us with our story today on Audrey Marie Hilly? Okay. Audrey Marie Hilly was born in 1933 in Blue Mountain, Alabama. Her parents, Huey and Lucille Frazier, worked at the linen mill to provide for their family, and Marie, as she was known, was often cared for by relatives when her mother worked. Uh, Mom returned to work pretty quickly after the baby was born because they needed a two-income family. That was unusual in the 1930s. Well, we're in the Depression yeah, that's Things true. pretty tough. So everybody was working. Good yeah. point. I yeah. mean, the, the Frasers were, were pretty lower middle class, and, and they needed to have a two-salary income. Sure. 
Huey and Lucille these days would be regarded as spoiling her child. They tended to show love to Marie by buying her material things rather than by spending time with her or showing affection. So she was always well-dressed and she always had the toys that she wanted. But she was kind of spoiled and she began to expect to get everything that she wanted. She got to be known for her temper tantrums when things didn't go her way and her parents were not very good at providing discipline or setting limits. So they're, they're wanting what's best for their daughter, and they're going to kind of let her run the place. <laughs> Which would set the tone for her whole life, unfortunately. It does. Mm-hmm. So the, the Frasers, Marie's parents, were determined that their only child would not spend her life working in the mills like they had to, and like most people in their town had to. They wanted more for their daughter. So they instilled in her the ambition to be a secretary. And before you start scoffing, that was a big deal for someone from that particular town. I would never scoff at any job. A job's a job. I have respect for any kind of work yeah. a person does. That's true. But yeah. their, their expectations were not set real high for her. It's not like they're thinking, oh, she's going to go to college and be a teacher or something like that. They're, no, that's true. They were hoping that she could just move up one rung of the ladder. Sure. Which was probably more than most people in their neighborhood did, though. Yeah, no, right? I, I understand that. Yeah. Well, in 1945, the Frasers moved from Blue Mountain to Anniston. Anniston was a whole new world to uh, Marie, because she was a girl who felt she was above the rest in her old hometown. But now she'd gone from being a big fish in a small pond to being a little tiny fish in this very upscale town. For the first time in her life, Marie found herself as just an ordinary girl. In Anniston, all the girls wore nice dresses, and some of their parents were even the owners of the same mills where Marie's parents were working. But Marie worked hard in school trying to make something of herself, and she made a name for herself as a responsible, intelligent student. She was able to integrate into new social circles. The new friends she made were from privileged families, and Marie wanted to be part of that group. She was a pretty girl, and that got her a lot of the attention she wanted from boys, too. By the end of the seventh grade, Marie had been voted the prettiest girl in school, and that made her feel very proud. It was around this time that 16-year-old Frank Hilly noticed 12-year-old Marie, and by the time he graduated from high school, he was in love with her. Unlike Marie's parents, who loved their daughter but showed little affection, Frank Hilly's family was overtly warm and very affectionate. The Hillies worked in pipe making, and even though they didn't have a lot of money, Clarence and Carrie Hilly were able to make a comfortable home for their three children, Frank and his sisters, Jewel and Frida. Yeah, now Marie's parents did not approve of Frank, and it wasn't because he was that much older than her. Although, and I know things were different back in the, the 40s, but... 12-year-old going out with a 16-year-old? Well, I don't think they were going out. When he was 18 and graduated, he was in love with her. By then, she was 14 Yeah, so she's 14, 14. Now. <laughs> She was <Okay>. older. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but yeah, anyway, the, Marie's folks didn't like him because he wasn't from one of the wealthier families in Anniston, so therefore he wasn't up to the standards that they had set for Marie. Marie's parents wanted much more for her. They wanted her to have all the things she could ever want. But at the time, Marie was happy to be Frank's girlfriend, as he obviously adored her, and he treated her like a queen. Yes, Frank joined the Navy after high school, and he was assigned to travel to Guam. But the distance between Marie and him really bothered Frank. He started feeling insecure, feeling worried that with him so far away, and with so much time spent apart, Marie would find another guy. That's a realistic fear. So in May 1951, Marie and Frank got married. Marie was a married woman before she even graduated from high school. Marie stayed in Anniston to finish her high school degree, and then she joined Frank in Long Beach, California, which was a pretty cool place to be reassigned to. Frank had been sending all of his paychecks home to her, but then when the time came for her to join him in California, she didn't have the money to pay for the plane ticket. Yeah, she apparently had been spending the money as fast as she received the checks. Yeah, she liked to shop. She liked to buy herself clothes and things like that. And, and she and hadn't told him about it, so this was kind of a shock. 
No, and this is going to be something that's a recurring theme through their marriage. Oh, absolutely. We'll, we'll talk about that, but I'd be a little worried <laughs> if, if I'm sending all my paychecks home to my bride. Yeah. With the understanding that she's going to save this money and then come out to be with me. I'd be rather pissed off. Well, that's a betrayal, isn't it, of their relationship and making plans together. It really is. Yep. But, I mean, she was young, so I could see giving her a break. What else are you going to do, really? I know. So his parents did end up paying for her to fly out to California, and he forgave her. Now, he finished his time in the Navy in Boston with Marie at his side. And while they were in Boston, Marie became pregnant with their first child. Wanting to be near family, they moved back to Anniston, and they bought a small house. Frank got work with the local foundry, and Marie accomplished her goal of becoming a secretary. So everything seems pretty hunky-dory at this point. Right. We're, we're married. We're having our first child. We both have jobs. Marie has a job that her parents had aspired to. Sounds good, right? It all sounds good so far. So far, so good. Their first child was Michael, and he was born in November of 1952. So everything looks ideal inside the Hilly home. It does. You know, we got two parents working, making a combined pretty decent income. They have a young, healthy, well-cared-for baby. Everything looks good. We have, obviously, some extra spending with a baby. Well, yeah, babies are expensive. Babies don't come free. Despite all the extra money that was going out for the newborn... Marie's spending didn't decrease at all. On herself, right? Not on herself. Now, Frank, for his part, found that giving in to her preserved the peace in the household. So he's following the same path that her parents took, is that, <laughs> yeah, just ignore stuff. Right, let it go, keep the peace. Yep. Yeah. But then in 1959, Marie's behavior became eviler. She started to taunt Frank with love letters that she claimed were written to her from other men. She wouldn't let him see the letters, and she tore them up right in front of him. So why was she doing this? Do you know what the psychological uh, motivation there was? Well, apparently she perceived him as not being as attentive as he should. Oh, well, I think she's the one who sees that initial adoration and wanted that to be maintained through her whole life. Yes. And she probably wanted to be the center of attention. Having a baby, then you kind of lose being the center of attention, which you should. But she would leave these pieces of letters where Frank could find them. And by the time he pieced them together, he did realize that Marie had written them to herself. When confronted with this, Marie said she was just afraid that Frank didn't love her anymore, and she was trying to make him jealous. That's I guess a, it's not really evil, though. No, but that's just a weird way to go about things, don't you think? It's Yeah, it's not right. It's not normal. I'm not thinking I'm being paid as much attention to me as I should be. So I'm going to pretend that I have a lover. Maybe not a lover, but admirers. But then I'm going to write the letters myself so that my <laughs> husband will be sure to recognize the handwriting and realize that it's all a hoax. Show some immaturity for sure. But by this time, Marie was spending twice as much as she was earning at her job, buying herself fine clothes and other luxuries. And to prevent Frank from finding out, since he was very fiscally conservative, Marie started getting up early to intercept the bills that were coming in the mail. So I guess their mail came early in the morning and she'd jump up and grab it and hide it, which I've never understood this tact because you're going to well, get caught eventually. All, all you're doing is postponing the inevitable. At some point, the companies are going to start sending collectors out after you. Absolutely, and that's what will happen. But that was a stopgap method and it worked for a while. Sure. So then Marie became pregnant again, and on January 14th, 1960, gave birth to a daughter who was named Carol, with a middle name Marie, after her mom. Now this is, uh, what, uh, she's eight years younger than her older brother. Yeah, and there's a little bit of a... Eight years between them. Maybe that was unintentional or intentional? What do you think? I have no idea. I mean, maybe they decided to wait a while. She was awfully young. Yeah. Plus, she probably liked to have the money for herself. Another baby was going to take up time and money that could go to her. That's true. But maybe that's it. Could be. But it seems like there's a fairly long time between the two kids. Between the first and second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was. But by the time Carol was born, Frank had received a promotion at work. 
so maybe that's why they decided to have another baby. But Marie had a reputation as an outstanding executive secretary. She was doing quite well. However, even though the family income had increased, it really couldn't keep pace with Marie's spending. And at the same time, Marie was developing a disturbing work pattern. She was not well-liked, maybe even loathed, by her co-workers. Marie fell into a pattern of working a job for a while and then leaving. She would tell friends and family that she was being ganged up on and picked on by her co-workers. So nevertheless, her bosses always gave her a good reference because she always put on a good face for them. So she never had trouble finding a new job. Yeah, well, she had a pattern, and she would work hard to ingratiate herself with the boss, maybe even sleep with him. Really? Did you read about that? Yeah. Oh, okay. And I think you're going to see that when Frank started getting sick and he came home from work early one day because he was sick and he found his wife in bed with her boss. She did manage to be in a good relationship with her bosses. Yes. For whatever reason. They liked her. They liked her a lot. (laughs) And, And the people she worked with, for the most part, were either indifferent or really disliked her. Well, I can kind of see this. They could probably see right past her. She was a phony kissing up to the boss. I mean, we've all known people a little bit like this. Yeah. And, ingratiate and she, themselves to the boss and treat everyone else like crap. Right. And then they're not well-liked overall. And, and they're the, the type of person who's always, like you said, the center of attention. So every conversation at lunchtime or break time is about her. So I can see where people probably didn't like her too much. Especially women, I would say who probably most of her co-workers were women. I'll bet 99% of them. Yeah. Maybe 100%. Maybe. This was a long time ago. But over time, the citizens of Anniston grew to know the Hillies. Frank was a member of the Elks Club and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and very well liked around town. Marie became active in her church, and she volunteered at her kids' school. Now, many felt that she was quirky, but most people still thought she was a pretty nice person. Yeah, I like that. I was trying to read a little bit more into that when I was researching this, and and the best I could come up with was quirky. I think most of the people that knew her didn't particularly like her that much, but they tolerated her because she was active in community activities and stuff, and she did things. And she seemed to be a good mother when they were little. Yeah. Yeah. When they were growing up, Mike and Carol Hilly wanted for nothing. Like her own parents, Marie showered her children with material possessions, but at the same time remained emotionally distant. She didn't discipline, leaving that task to Frank's mother, who cared for the kids while the parents worked. Marie favored Mike, and she was less fond of Carol, and as Carol got into her teens, she was even branded a lesbian by Marie. Which to Marie was a very bad thing. Well, yeah, back in the day in Alabama... Well, I think she was angry, wasn't she, at Carol? Because Carol wasn't girly and didn't like dresses like yeah, Marie had. she was pissed off at She her. didn't like who Carol was as a person, which is a terrible thing for a mother to do. Tough showing favoritism, right? Well, it's, it's more than favoritism. I mean, it's really a dislike for her own daughter. But Frank sensed that, and he sensed that Marie was showing a preference for Mike. So he tried to give some special attention to Carol because... He's trying to love his kids equally, which is what you're supposed to try and do. But this angered Marie even more, because she didn't like that her husband was paying attention to her daughter and not to her. Which shows a sickness right there. Shows something's wrong with her. If you're jealous of your own child. (laughs) Doesn't it? Yeah. Mike graduated high school in 1972, and he wanted to become a minister. So he left home to attend college out of state. From what I've read, he was uh, pretty happy to be out of the house. Yeah, I think it was a tough household. A lot, of, a lot of strife. But Frank was really continuing to worry about his wife's behavior because the spending was continuing unabated. And when he would confront Marie, it would get him nowhere. She would just not change her ways no matter what. What she actually did was she ended up renting a safe deposit box and began to have some of the bills sent there so Frank wouldn't know how much she was actually spending. Yeah, now again, this is another short-term solution, Yeah. right? Well, yeah, it's just building up and getting worse and worse, yeah. She also, incredibly, began taking out loans in his name. And this was fairly easy in Anniston because Frank was well-known as a man who paid his bills on time. But eventually, 
creditors became concerned because bills and loan payments were coming due and weren't being paid by Frank Gilly. And poor Frank had no idea. So by the fall of 1974, Frank couldn't ignore his domestic difficulties any longer. And worse still, he wasn't feeling well. And he'd been sick for quite some time. And as I said before, this is where things are starting with his poisoning, okay, his yeah. early, early symptoms. Right. And at the time he came home from work, and there's Marie in bed with her boss. Right, yeah. So do you think she was poisoning him to be with the boss, do we know? Or was she just poisoning him to get some life insurance she, money to take care of her financial She was poisoning him to get the life insurance money. So it was all about just the financial situation, yeah. you think? It was. And maybe secondarily, in the back of her mind, by poisoning him and causing his death, she'd be free to marry up. That's what I was thinking. She wanted to upgrade. She wanted more money. Yeah. But there must have been some kind of uh, either hate or at least apathy towards Frank in order to do this to him. Oh, I think so. I think there was a lot of people leading separate lives, married but not equal or something like that. Yeah, and I don't want to throw labels around, but maybe she was a little bit of a psychopath, sociopath. Well, maybe, since she poisoned a few people. <laughs> and she didn't seem to mind doing it. Yeah. Well, she, she did what she needed to do. That's the way she saw it, sure. So 1974 had not been a good year for Frank. He was ill. He had frequent bouts of nausea and vomiting. He felt tired all the time. He just felt like shit. Mm. Frank is like a lot of us guys. We don't want to admit when we're ill. So he was popping Alka-Seltzer, trying to rest more, just kind of taking it easy, treating his own symptoms. But despite all this, his health continued to decline. So finally, in May of 1975, he talked to his family doctor, Dr. Earl Jones. Dr. Jones felt he had sort of a stomach bug type of thing, although in retrospect, something that's going on for that length of time is probably not a stomach bug. But anyway. Well, we don't know what Frank told the doctor either. We don't. But whatever Dr. Jones tried didn't seem to work. So one day in late May, after seeing the doctor for a few weeks, his sister Frida came to visit him. Frank told Frida he never felt as sick as he had, and he was afraid he was going to die. And then he also told Frida that Marie had given him an injection, supposedly under the orders of Dr. Jones. So maybe if the sister had called the doctor right then and checked on that, Frank could have lived. They could have figured it out. Maybe. Because the doctor would have said, no, I didn't tell her to inject him with anything. I mean, yeah. normally that doesn't happen. But by this point, he's been ill for over a year. Mm -hmm. Well, because she's continuing to poison him, right? Yeah. So if we could stop the poisoning at, at that point, he might have been fine. Yeah, although poor old Frank didn't last too much longer. So. No, he was admitted to the hospital the next day after that, which was May 23rd. Tests at that point indicated liver failure due to infectious hepatitis. That's a little premature. I mean, you can say his liver function tests are disturbed, so he's got hepatitis. And maybe one of the likely things is infectious hepatitis, which you would get from ingesting bad food or bad drink that had the hepatitis virus in it. But it's, it's tough. You can't say that the test indicated infectious hepatitis. It, it would indicate hepatitis of some sort. And apparently he was deep enough into this that his liver was failing. Again, this is a chronic type of thing, not an acute process. That's true, but do the doctors know how long it's been going on is what I'm wondering. Well, I think they would have known that it had been going on for several months. I would hope so. But Frank was on the way out. Well, his son Mike came home from Georgia, where he was at school, to be with him. And Frank was quite agitated and delirious. Mike actually had to restrain him from jumping out of a window. So on May 25th, Mike left the hospital to pick up his grandmother so they could visit Frank. And when he returned just an hour later, his mother was asleep and his father was dead. And Frank was only 45 years old. Right. So he's admitted to the hospital and two days later he's dead. That's it. Yeah. So because of the suddenness of his death, an autopsy was recommended. And the interesting thing to me is that Marie 
quite willingly gave her consent to the autopsy. And the autopsy showed that he did have hepatitis, along with some swelling, or edema is the term, of the lungs and kidneys, stomach inflammation, and pneumonia in both lungs. Now, is this related to the poisoning? What did she poison him with? She poisoned him with arsenic. We don't know that at the time. Right. But that will give you liver disease, kidney disease. If it's ingested orally, you'll get stomach inflammation. And the pneumonias are are just kind of incidental findings. That's not strictly related. Something from being in bed? Yeah. Well, since the autopsy report indicated Frank had died of natural causes, Marie had no trouble collecting on the life insurance. She got $31,000, and she went on a shopping spree, had a great old time, bought herself a car, clothes, and jewelry. She also got a diamond ring for her mother, Lucille. Mike and his wife, Terry, got appliances and clothes, and Carol got a car and a stereo, among some other things. So at least she did share the wealth. She didn't spend it all on herself. Right. Well, she might have spent most of it, but yeah. And even with his daughter that she's constantly bickering with, got her a car and a stereo. But is this just to make herself look good to other people? Probably. That's what I would think. Sure. But this small financial windfall wasn't making her a happy woman in any permanent sense. She complained constantly that no one in her family loved her, and she was always fighting with Carol. Then she also complained about her boss and her job. I guess this was the next one who she wasn't having sex with. I don't know. She moved around a lot from job to job. She did. And she slept with more than one boss. She would use her feminine wiles on more than one boss. I love that phrase, feminine wiles. I don't know if she slept with every boss, but she did what she needed to do to make sure that the bosses appreciated her. Absolutely. How's that? Yes. So Marie gathered her family about her. This is a trying time. Her husband's dead. Besides Carol, Marie's mother, Lucille who had recently been diagnosed with cancer, came to live with them. Then Marie also extended an invitation to Mike and his wife, Terry, to live with her, too. Mike had just taken a job as an assistant pastor at a nearby church, and he really liked the idea of having his family close to him as he began his career in the ministry. Good idea. Sounds good. On paper. Now, he, he pretty quickly came to regret this decision. I mean, even in a normal family, you know, air quotes, normal, it's hard to live with family. Yes, it is. But Marie sounds like she was really tough to live with. Yes, she was. I mean, she she and Carol fought constantly, so there's always arguments in the air. And Marie also had a lot of demands on Mike's time that wore him down. So he's trying to start his first job as a pastor, and he's got all this stuff with his mom that she needs him for. And here's a huge red flag. Mike's wife, Terry, Marie's daughter-in-law, was getting ill a lot with stomach trouble when she lived with Marie. During the time she and Mike lived with Marie, Terry was actually hospitalized four times. That's amazing. And she also had a miscarriage. Terry's health issues, along with this constant tension in the home, prompted Mike and Terry to move out. So good for them. And I think as soon as she was out of there, she started feeling better, right? Oh, she did. Miraculously. But but it didn't happen that easily. There was still stuff that Marie was trying to do. Mike and Terry found this nice apartment, but the night before they were going to move, Marie's house caught fire. So Mike and Terry moved into the apartment, and Marie, Carol, and Lucille came with them. Oh, goodness. So Terry must have been thinking, oh, my God. So we've not accomplished anything, except we've probably backslid a little because they're in a smaller place than they were previously. With a lot of people. With all the people. Yeah. So then they, they got Marie's house repaired, and the family's ready to move back. Then the apartment next to Mike and Terry's caught fire, and they had to vacate their apartment while repairs were undertaken. So they had to move back to Marie's also. So they've gone a few months accomplishing nothing. Either Marie's been living with them or they've still been living with Marie. So do we know why Marie wanted them to be with her? Was it just for the company? Control? Yeah. Did she want to continue poisoning Terry, I wonder? Did she have plans to get rid of Terry? Who knows? I mean, someone like that, I wouldn't be surprised if they were jealous of their son's wife getting his attention. Yeah. 
No, she's never been charged with trying to poison her daughter-in-law. No. And it's never been mentioned, but it is suspicious that shortly after she moved in with Marie, Terry started having symptoms similar to Frank. Oh, it's more than suspicious. She was actually hospitalized four times. Yeah, but nothing came of those. Because nobody had any idea. Not at that point. It was just this poor widow. Now, the, the only good thing was eventually Mike and Terry did find their own home. And they did move out. Well, and good for them. Terry's health improved once they had moved out and got away from Marie. Sure. In 1977, in January, Marie's mother Lucille died of her cancer. Marie received a small sum of $600 from a burial policy. Then, in the months following Lucille's death, the Anderson Police Department became very familiar with Marie because she called them all the time. She would report numerous petty thefts from her home. She'd report gas leaks. She would claim someone had started a small fire in a closet in her home. Just bizarre things. Then there was a neighbor, Doris Ford, who was reporting similar occurrences in her home. By coincidence, Marie had a key to Doris's house. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So Marie thought someone at the telephone company was behind all this harassment as the calls only seemed to happen when the trace was taken off her phone. Interesting. Interesting, isn't it? And the other interesting thing is when police did put a trace on Doris's phone, the neighbor, who was having the same things happen to her, when the police put a trace on her phone, the calls were traced back to where Marie worked. Now, they couldn't go any further than that, just that it was at her place of employment. They didn't know who was making the calls from there. Well, yeah, but who else would it be? It's certainly suspicious stuff, isn't it? I would think so. Now, Carol. Carol graduated high school in 1978. She and Marie moved in with Mike and Terry in their new home in Pompano Beach, Florida. Marie got a job, but her reckless spending habits continued to cause problems. Shortly after her arrival, Marie had run up $600 in charges on Mike's credit card. She promised to pay him back. Marie and Carol fought all the time. Mike and Terry had a new baby, and while Marie did seem to dote over him, she was not being helpful around the house. After a few months, Marie and Carol moved out. Mike and Terry were happy to see that happen, especially Mike. He thought that Marie had really developed an unhealthy fixation on their newborn son, and he was actually worried that his mother might kidnap the baby. That's a big deal. Now, why would he think that? Well, I'm not sure why he would think it to that extent. I mean, I know that he was worried about all the attention that Marie is heaping on the kid. Yeah. And I think he was looking back at when he was a child and all the attention that Marie would lather on him. And he was thinking this this isn't heading down a healthy way. But I don't know where he came up with the idea that she could kidnap him. Yeah, so it must have been pretty extreme if he felt that way. It must have been. Let's take a minute here to talk about our sponsor. Madison. Yeah, we've been sponsored by Madison Reed for some time, and that's because it really is one of my favorite beauty products. Once you find something that gives you what you need, you know, like Marie found arsenic, gave her what she needed, you want to stick with it and tell others about it. I also love that it's a company founded by a woman and a mom, Amy Arrett, who named the company after her own daughter. The way she's managed to combine salon quality that we really love with the affordability we really need to give us beautiful, multi-dimensional hair color at home is really revolutionizing the way that women color their hair. She's bringing us into the future, and we're looking good. If you've been coloring your hair for a while like me, you probably have some horror stories of do-it-yourself hair disasters. The uncertainty and so-so quality of store-bought coloring kits motivated me to go to a professional and spend a lot of money. But Madison Reed has brought me back home with its high-quality, convenient hair color. When you use Madison Reed, you'll look like you just walked out of a salon. It's convenient at-home hair color, and it has an ammonia-free salon-quality formula. Madison Reed is made in Italy, and it's delivered to your door for under $25. And I really love how Madison Reed has hair models of all ages, colors, and sizes on their website. It's a product developed by a real woman and marketed to real women. You can find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. And as if that isn't enough, Madison Reed is continuing to honor our True Crime Brewery listeners 
by giving us 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit with the promo code BREWERY. The website again is madison-reed.com and our code is BREWERY. Thanks, Madison Reed. You do a good job, Madison. She makes me feel pretty. So let's go back to the story. Now we're getting back to Aniston. Marie and Carol didn't have any place to live. So they lived briefly with Frank's sister, Frida. Then they moved in with his mother, Carrie. Once they got ensconced in Carrie's house, the strange occurrences started again. Things would go missing, phones would be sabotaged, small fires were started. Illness also struck. Carrie Hilly started to have episodes of nausea and vomiting. So this is Marie's mother-in-law. This is the mother-in-law. Well, the fact that they had no place to live really makes me think that there was um, a real disruption in the household with Terry and Mike. Like, they really wanted her out. It wasn't just a matter of her finding a place and moving out. There must have been an uproar. Yeah, something There must have been a falling out of some kind. Because they got back to home and didn't have a spot to live. Right. So now Marie's mother-in-law is getting sick. And Marie got a job at Dresser Industries and also worked nights for Harold Dillard, who owned a local construction company. Then, of course, she began an affair with Dillard. And this affair seemed like it was specifically designed to bring him under her spell and get him to leave his marriage. Almost at the same instant, she began an affair with an old school friend named Calvin Robertson, who lived in San Francisco. And she told Robertson that she had cancer but couldn't afford the treatments. So he sent her money. And she soon returned news to him that she had been miraculously cured. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> so it's a little Bonnie Lee Bagley-ish I know. activity she's doing. But it's working because Calvin came to visit Marie and Aniston, and he was really smitten with her. The only problem was he wasn't quite ready to leave his wife for her. And that really pissed Marie off. Yeah, so she's worked on a couple guys in uh, rapid succession or pretty simultaneously. Well, you know, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to diversify. Nobody was uh, leaving their wife yet. Not yet. Nope. After her return to Aniston, Marie started buying lots of insurance, including life insurance. She got several policies. She got fire insurance, cancer coverage, life insurance. And then she also insured the lives of her children. She insured Mike for $25,000, and for Carol, she took out two different policies for a total of $39,000. So you're thinking, okay, what's next? Yeah, but you have to think back then, $39,000 was enough to buy a nice house, right? especially down south in yeah. Alabama. So it's more money than we're thinking when we look at that amount. But when you look at this and you think, okay, knowing now what's been going on, You think, oh, there's an ulterior motive to these life insurance policies. Well, of course, yeah. Especially she got more for Carol, who she liked less, so that's interesting. Right. Well, and sure (laughs) enough, what happened? Well, in April 1979, Carol fell ill. What a surprise. She was only 19, and she was attending college nearby, and she had returned for her high school's annual junior-senior prom. The night's festivities included the usual young adult things like food, drink, alcohol, maybe a little marijuana. And as the party wore on, Carol became nauseated. The symptoms weren't terribly serious, so she ignored them and tried to focus on just having fun. But then the next day, it just returned with a vengeance. Carol had to leave church early, and she vomited right in the parking lot. When she arrived home, she learned that her grandmother, Carrie had been admitted to the hospital after she fainted in church. So the bodies are just falling left and right here. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah. So after this initial episode, Carol wasn't going to be entirely well for a really long time. She got sicker and sicker over the summer. The nausea and vomiting, which by now was almost constant, was also accompanied by tingling sensations in her hands and feet and increasing muscle weakness. Now, these are signs of late arsenic poisoning. Now, what do you mean by late? Chronic arsenic poisoning. it's been in her system a while. So, it's been going on for a while. The vomiting, stomach ache, diarrhea, all the GI symptoms are things that were more with acute poisoning. Now, do we know where this arsenic was coming from? Is there something you can buy over the counter? Yeah, you can buy it in insect sprays and 
stuff Rat like that. Rat poison? Poisons, yeah. There's different ways. Okay. But Carol's stuff, now that she's at the point where she's got nerve defects, she's got motor and sensory defects in her nerves, her arms and legs. That's uh, scary. And she's got some findings that we'll talk about in her fingernails. That's signs of chronic poisoning. But anyway, she's sick. And this is someone doing it to their own child, which always amazes me. And it's not a Munchausen type situation. She's no. not doing it for the intention of she's, taking she's care of her. Doing it for the intention of killing her. It's out and out murder. Okay. By August 1979, Carol had been to the ER several times for this nausea and vomiting. And after one of these episodes, Marie gave Carol an injection, which she said would relieve her nausea. And she led Carol to believe the injection was at the doctor's suggestion, that she was just doing this under his direction. Right, just like she had with Frank. Right. So she was telling Carol, this is going to make you feel better. It's going to help the nausea and vomiting, but it made her worse. And then on August 22nd, she was admitted to the hospital. And this was in Aniston. She got admitted for evaluation and treatment. And a week goes by, and her physician, Dr. Warren Sorrell, hadn't been able to come up with a diagnosis. So it was at this time that he was starting to think, well, maybe there's a psychiatric etiology. And he referred her for psych evaluation in Birmingham. Well, that's strange to me, because wouldn't her blood work show that there really was something wrong? Are they doing this because she's a young woman, and, you know, young women are unreliable and often have complaints like this, according to these old guys? Yeah, I would lean that way. Yeah. I mean... She had to have had some abnormal blood tests. I'll bet her liver function tests were abnormal and her other tests of electrolytes and kidney function and stuff weren't normal either. So he's just kind of dismissing her as a hysterical woman. Yeah. And, you know, who knows? Maybe Marie was supporting that and kind of going along with that. Probably was. So Carol's going to Birmingham and she's under the care of Dr. John Elmore. During the time she's there in Birmingham... She got a couple more injections by her mother. Marie told Carol the injections had been supplied by a registered nurse. Yeah. Doris Ford, and that Carol shouldn't tell anyone because they didn't want to get Doris into trouble for giving her the medication. Weaving some big lies here. Uh Uh-huh. Now confined to the hospital, Carol had no knowledge of her mother's increasing entanglement with the law. The checks Marie had written for Carol's apartment had bounced, as well as many others. And the bank filed charges against Marie. So she was arrested and released on bail. And meanwhile in Florida, Mike Hilly was slowly concluding that his father had not died of natural causes. So he's becoming suspicious of his mom. He's thinking things over. Mm -hmm. And he actually inquired about the possibility of an exhumation and was told that a lot of new evidence would be needed in order for them to go ahead and do that. So what's making him so suspicious of his mom? Was it the fact that his wife was sick when he was with her and got better? I I think he's looking at, you know, his wife's illness and now his sister's illness. And his father's death. And his father's death. And he's thinking, you know, there's a relationship between all these things. Yeah, that's a long way to go, though, when you're thinking about your own mom. So to me, that just shows that he knew his mom wasn't quite right. Or he wouldn't even consider that about someone. I think so. Yeah. But it was someone named Eve Cole who finally sounded the alarm. Eve was a friend of Carol's from church, and she had been present one night when Marie gave Carol an injection. So that was stupid of Marie to do it in front of someone. Yes. When Carol was hospitalized, Eve called her to wish her well, and Carol mentioned that Marie had been giving her more injections while she was in the hospital. This concerned Eve, who told Carol's Aunt Frida, who called Mike, who in turn called his sister, Carol. And then Mike talked to the doctor, Dr. Elmore. So they're putting these things together. It's kind of closing in on Marie now, isn't it? Starting to, right? Yes. On September 18th, 1979, Dr. Elmore sat down with Marie and told her Carol was suffering from vitamin deficiencies and malnutrition and possibly lead poisoning. He thought Marie might be part of the problem. He, He didn't really elaborate on this, but he said, you know, Maybe it'd be good if you don't visit Carol for a while. (laughs) So Marie got pissed off, obviously, and she had Carol discharged from the hospital against medical advice. Well, she could probably sense that he was onto her at that point. Yeah, but it didn't last long. 
So they spent the night in a motel, and then Carol was admitted the very next day to the University of Alabama Hospital in Birmingham, this time under the care of Dr. Brian Thompson. So she's purposely sending her to a new place, a new doctor, who right. won't know the suspicions. But that same day, Marie was arrested again on more check charges. And this arrest probably saved Carol's life. I think oh, she would have done Carol in otherwise. Yeah, she would have continued to give her the injections. Yeah. Dr. Thompson noticed that besides the numbness of Carol's hands and feet, she had these striations on her nails. These are called Aldridge Meese lines and are typically seen in arsenic poisoning. Yeah, you get these white transverse lines across your nails. And what makes that happen? Well, it's, it's the arsenic accumulating in growth plates, growth tissues. So the other way, I mean, if you look at hair samples, the closer to the scalp has more arsenic and the farther away has less arsenic because the hair grows out. Right. I think I've seen that on forensic files. Yeah. Do you need some time of arsenic poisoning before you see these? This isn't something that happens the first or second time. No, this is chronic stuff. Okay. You have to do blood and urine samples to get more of an acute idea. Mm -hmm. But if you suspect chronic poisoning, you look at hair and nails. That's why Dr. Thompson ordered some tests on Carol's hair at that point. And the initial findings showed that Carol had over 50 times the normal arsenic level of human hair. Because there is a minute amount of arsenic in our hair, naturally anyways, correct? There is. Yeah. I mean, we all are exposed to arsenic. But it's in such tiny quantities that we're fine. Well, further testing showed that the hair closest to her scalp, which you said would be the most concentrated, and that makes sense, had 100 times the normal levels while the ends had none. So this led investigators to believe that Carol had been systematically poisoned with arsenic over a period of at least four to eight months. Furthermore, without Marie's visits, Carol's health was improving quite rapidly. Interesting. That's the telltale sign, isn't it? Yes. So subsequently, events occurred pretty rapidly. Frank Healy's body was exhumed because we had all this new information. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He had large levels of arsenic in his body. Frank's sister Frieda searched the house where Marie and Carol lived and found a bottle with a liquid in it, and testing revealed the liquid to be arsenic. And they also found arsenic in a pill bottle that was in Marie's purse when she was arrested. That's a lot of arsenic. Holy shit. Then they exhumed Lucille Frazier's body. That's Marie's mother. Yeah, but I thought she died of cancer. She had cancer. But they also found large amounts of arsenic in her body. And it was a cancer that had ultimately killed her, but she was poisoned with arsenic also. And the mother-in-law, Carrie Hilly, her body also had elevated arsenic levels. So Marie's been a busy woman. But Carrie Hilly was still alive, right? Or did she die? She had died. Uh, what'd she die of? Uh, natural causes. Okay. But she had arsenic too. So yeah. do we know that she died of natural causes? We were told she died of natural causes. But she was poisoned at some point. She'd been exposed to arsenic. Well, I just wonder if the Lucille with cancer, maybe Marie just wanted to hurry that death along with a little arsenic. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking if you've already got cancer and you're already sick, the arsenic would probably affect you worse. It probably would. Yeah. But Marie didn't gain much financially from her mother's death. She only got that $600 burial policy. So, yeah, but she got her out of the way. Yeah. But in addition to the fraudulent check charges, now Marie was charged with the attempted murder of Carol. No charges at that point had been filed regarding Frank, Frank's mother, or Marie's mother, even without those charges, though. But even so, the bail was really low, which I wonder why. <laughs> it's a good question. I don't know. Well, five local residents were persuaded to put up a total of $14,000, and Marie was released on bail in November 1979. Her attorney, Wilford Lane, checked her into a local motel under the false name of Emily Stevens, I guess to protect her from the media and people. Right. On November 18th, which was a little over a week after she was released, the attorney went to the hotel to visit Marie, but she had disappeared. She'd taken off, and there was a note found in the motel room, which kind of suggested that she may have been kidnapped. Yeah. That's what she wants people to think, I guess. 
Right. But this whole thing, I mean, the bail was stupidly low. Yeah. And, and then her attorney, who put her in this hotel, no, nobody had contacted her for nine days, from the 9th where she was released on bail and put in the hotel, to the 18th when he went to visit her. Nobody had any contact with her, so she could have taken off any time. So that gave her a good head start, possibly. Yeah. I mean, so she's got a charge of attempted murder, and bail is really stupidly low, and they let her stay in a hotel. So boom, she's gone. Well, about 10 days after she'd left, Marie's Aunt Margaret found that her house had been broken into, and some clothes, her car, and a suitcase were missing. So she wondered if that was Marie. Seemed like it was. Probably was. And her car was found a few days later in Marietta, Georgia. At this point, the FBI became involved, and they tracked her through Georgia to Savannah, and then the trail went cold. Back in Anniston, the final toxicology reports on Frank Kelly came in, and in January 1980, Marie was indicted for the murder of Frank as well. So now we've got charges of fraudulent check activity, attempted murder, and first-degree murder. Yeah, but she's gone. But they she, don't know where she is. She's rabbited. Well, I guess meanwhile, what had happened is Marie made her way to Florida and assumed a new identity. This was Robbie Hannon was her new name. And she was working her charms on a man named John Homan. So according to Marie and John, they met at a bar in Fort Lauderdale in February of 1980. John was a 33-year-old owner of a boat business. Marie claimed that she was 35, even though she was really 47, and she said she was from Texas. She said she'd lost both her children in a car accident. John was kind of a shy, introverted man. He was recently divorced, and he was easily seduced by Marie. He really was no match for her. Yeah, no, he was a piece of cake. By March, they moved in together, and Marie got a job at an accounting firm using a fictitious resume. In October 1980, she and John left Florida and went all the way to New Hampshire, where John's brother Peter was living. So John and Robbie, who was Marie, were married in May 1981, and they rented a small house up in Marlow, New Hampshire. John found work at Findings, Inc., where he made small parts for jewelry. Marie found a customer service job at Central Screw Corporation in Keene, New Hampshire. Her efficiency and her southern charm really helped her to excel. Her co-workers really found her to be fascinating. So living as Robbie, Marie told them of her children's tragic deaths, of growing up wealthy in Texas, and of this large inheritance that was coming to her one day. Some of her co-workers found her abrasive and bossy and really weren't very fond of her. But most considered her to be sympathetic, at least for the story of losing her children. But, as always, the men in particular enjoyed her company. Yeah, so she's following her pattern in the South. Yeah, but she can build it up even more now because she can make up all these outlandish stories because no one really knows her. But the same thing, the bosses love her and her co-workers don't like her. Right. So, and she's continuing to work at Central Screw. Which is just hilarious. I like that name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for her. She's just centrally screwing everybody. Yeah. <laughs> And her stories, Marie's stories, became more and more convoluted. So she told those who worked with her that she's dying of a rare blood disease that caused her to make too many red blood cells. So Marie left John alone from time to time, telling him and co-workers that she was being treated by various specialists out of state. And she also started talking about her twin sister, a woman named Terry Martin. Twin Terry lived in Texas, was having marital problems, and needed Marie to come visit. So Marie said she's going to go help her sister Terry out, and at the same time, Terry would be helping Marie deal with a chronic illness. John was going to remain in New Hampshire, and Terry would take care of Marie, Robbie, or whatever name, <laughs> yeah. or, or Robbie, in Texas. But of course, there's no incurable disease that she has. All this was lies. She didn't have any twin sons that died in a car accident, as she'd said and she didn't have a twin sister back in Texas. But she left Marlowe in September 1982 and only stayed in Texas for a few days. In September, she arrived back in Florida. She had her hair bleached and then looked for employment under this name, Terry Martin, the supposed twin sister's name. She's not using the Robbie name now. 
Right, she's using Terry Martin. But by the end of the day, she was employed as a secretary at Solar Testing Service. Only took her that long. She was there for about six weeks, and she told her new boss, Jack McKenzie, about her sister's serious illness, because now she's the twin sister talking yeah. about the other twin sister. Yeah, see, it gets more and more convoluted, it's doesn't it? It's very convoluted. So she's Terry, not Robbie, but she's telling her boss about Robbie's supposed cancer diagnosis, the too many red blood cells. Right. So Mackenzie received a call in November from his secretary, who said that her sister had suffered a stroke and developed cancer. She was going to go home and care for her, and she wanted Mackenzie to know how much she appreciated him. So on November 10th, Marie, in her role of Terry, called John Homan, her man back in New Hampshire, and told him about the death of his wife, Robbie. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> Everyone gets that, right? <laughs> it's, it's tough to follow. It is. So she's telling her guy back in New Hampshire that his wife died and that she's the twin sister, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she's going to come up to comfort him and take care of him in New Hampshire. And this is where it gets really interesting. So here's the fascinating part. So she goes to New Hampshire. And for his part, John Homan believed Marie's story right up to the day she was arrested. And I think maybe initially, maybe you could buy that. I mean, her hair was bleached. She would lost a bunch of weight. And she just acted differently. She was a bit of an actress, yeah. So, so maybe that's true in the short term. But I don't see how you can be together with this woman for any length of time and not recognize that, hey, duh, that's the girl I was married to. <laughs> well, she actually went with him to the local paper to place the obituary for his wife, Robbie. And this seemingly innocent obituary was filled with a lot of fabricated details. And these would prove to be Marie's downfall. She'd kind of overdone it. John introduced Terry to the workers at Central Screw, and some of her former co-workers believed her story, but others were on to her. They just didn't, they didn't buy it. There was a lot of speculation. Well, if you're sitting there just looking at it, it's a fantastic story. It's an unbelievable story, don't you think? Yeah, but sometimes it's just so unbelievable that you think, well, no one would make that up, yeah. right? <laughs> Maybe that's it. Truth is stranger than fiction. True, well, that's true. But Terry, she moved in with Jack Homan, and she claimed that they needed to be together to comfort each other for a while. That's right. She's lost a sister, and he's lost a wife. <laughs> right. <laughs> so she got a job at Book Press in Brattleboro, Vermont, and for some time, things seemed to be going well. Meanwhile, back at Central Screw, a group of doubters were going over Robbie's obituary, and they found the obvious misstatements, and they took their findings to their manager, Ron Oya. Oya began doing some research of his own, and his research corroborated what the staffers were saying, so he went ahead and called police. Yeah, I, I guess the obituary had just lie after lie after lie, and, yeah. and it was easily verified. I wish we could have found it to read it. I would have loved that. I would have loved to put it in the show notes. Yeah, but it, it was all factitious and led to Marie's downfall. So after the manager called the police, Detective Bob Hardy of the Keene Police Department started interviewing the workers, and he did some inquiries on his own. So they thought in New Hampshire that Marie might be Carol Manning, who was a fugitive wanted for bank robbery. So they started tailing her and watching her. And they soon decided that she wasn't Carol Manning, but maybe she was another woman, Terry Lynn Clifton, who was also a fugitive. There's a lot of female fugitives about. Yeah, and they're all in New Hampshire, huh? Yeah. On January 12, 1983, police apprehended her at Book Press. They think they're arresting Terry Lynn Clifton. So when they asked her name, she surprised them. She said she was Audrey Marie Hilly, and she was wanted in Alabama on bad check charges. Well, to the surprise of the New Hampshire authorities, when they called Alabama, they found that not only were there bad check problems, but she was charged with attempted murder of her daughter and first-degree murder of her husband. Well, 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 as Kenda says. <laughs> So she's brought down to Alabama for trial. Judge Sam Monk presided over the trial. Assistant District Attorney Joe Hubbard was the prosecutor, and Wilfred Lane and Thomas Harmon defended Marie. Quick trial. 
and the jury deliberated only three hours before coming in with the verdict. Marie was found guilty of the murder of Frank and the attempted murder of Carol. She was given a life sentence for the murder and 20 more years for the poisoning. So she's done. You would think she'd be done at that point. Ah, but... Now, she entered the state woman's prison in Alabama in June 1983, and she was given the job of data processor, and she was classified as a medium security prisoner, despite being a murderer. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. And then, even though she was talking constantly of escape, and maybe even had made plans for an escape, she got reclassified in 1985 as a minimum security prisoner. And this made her eligible for passes and leaves from the prison. (laughs) It's just mind-boggling. It is, yeah. So in late 1986, her first eight-hour pass was approved. She did well (laughs) at that one. She came back. And three other passes of eight hours each came through without difficulty. So in February 1987, Maria qualified for a three-day furlough. All right. Well, John Homan had relocated to Anniston when Marie stood trial, and he and Marie spent the weekend together when she had her three-day furlough. Before returning to prison that Sunday, Marie told John she wanted to visit her parents' graves. She said she'd meet him at a local restaurant, but she never showed up. John found a note later in their hotel room that said, I hope you will be able to forgive me. I'm getting ready to leave. It will be best for everybody. We'll be together again. Please just give me an hour to get out of town. So Marie wrote that she was leaving with a man who would take her to Canada, and then she would contact John. But to John's credit, he went to the police. He did. So, and given her past history, authorities thought that Marie probably had a pretty well thought out plan. It didn't turn out that way. Five days after she escaped or disappeared, on a cold and rainy night, Police were called to a residence near Blue Mountain. So we've kind of come full circle. Where was Marie born? Right, Blue true, Mountain. true. A ranting and raving woman was on Sue Craft's porch, and she needed help. Now, this woman was not immediately recognized as Marie Hilly. She was critically ill with hypothermia and was transported to the local hospital. On the way to the hospital, she lost consciousness and began having seizures, and her heart stopped. When the ambulance arrived at the hospital, Marie's body temperature was only 81 degrees, and she could not be resuscitated. Wow. So you think she did that on purpose? Why would she do that? She just had nowhere to go? Well, the interesting thing, because there there was a lot of speculation about how involved was John Homan. Well, he called the police, though. Yeah. So one thought is that he was going to help her escape, and they'd live happily ever after and then chickened out. Oh, okay. So she was on her own. But it it looks like whatever plans she had didn't happen, and she ended up wandering around in the woods in the rain and the cold. And became hysterical. And Kind of lost her mind, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, I think it's really strange, though, that her children buried her beside Frank. So she's buried next to a guy she murdered. Right. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I wonder why they did that. I don't know. Maybe the plot was already paid for. (laughs) Oh, that's a cynical viewpoint. I like that. It could be, though. Why would you want to spend more money on her when she's been so evil? Just use the plot you've got. Yeah. (laughs) Poor Frank. He must have turned over in his grave when she was buried next to him. (laughs) Turned the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Just my back to you, lady. Right. That's sad. Well, it's just a wonder that she didn't kill more people, actually, because she certainly could have. Oh, she could have. Yeah. Yeah. I I think she got kind of on a roll. I I think she thought she'd gotten away with things. She had for a while, yeah. And, uh, I mean, look at, she was poisoning her daughter, her mother, her mother-in-law. She might have been poisoning her son's wife, her daughter-in-law. Who knows where she would have stopped. Well, she did some clever things after she took off. But then also, there had to be some mental illness involved in that stuff, don't you think? Duh. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Okay, you have anything else to add about Audrey Marie? No, she was a devious woman. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're going to move on to feedback, but just a quick reminder that if you have feedback 
Or if you have a crime you'd like to suggest, you can email us. You can direct message us, or you can leave us a voicemail. Just click on Leave Us a Voicemail on our website, tiegrabber.com, or you can record your feedback on your phone and email it to us at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Also, if True Crime Brewery is a positive part of your life and you might enjoy an extra episode once in a while, you can offer us your support by joining Team Tie Grabber at tiegrabber.com or by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Once you become a member, you get access to our members-only episodes, and we release a new one every month. We actually just released a new one yesterday, and that one was a stalking and murder case by a football player named Pernell Jefferson. He was stalking Jeannie. He killed a young woman, Jeannie Bukowski. So went back to like the 80s before the stalking laws and before people knew much about it. So really interesting case that we discussed there. It was. It was disheartening. Yeah, it's disheartening when you know these bad things are happening and nobody's doing what they might be able to do to stop it. Also, when you join, you're helping to pay for the costs of producing and distributing True Crime Brewery. And we're going to send you some gifts, so it's a win-win for both of us. Some other ways to offer us some support are to follow us on Twitter at Pods, on Instagram, or on Facebook. Also, if you have a few extra minutes, if you could leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. We appreciate that a lot. So let's start with our voicemails. How's that? We got some voicemails today. All right. Who's the first one? First one is Shannon from Connecticut. And she has a case suggestion. All right, let's listen to that and then we'll talk about it. Hi, Dick and Jill. My name is Shannon. I'm calling from Connecticut. I want to let you know I love your podcast and I look forward to every Tuesday. And once the download drops, I listen to it as soon as I possibly can. I love the way that you guys tell stories that maybe aren't as widely known as so many others. And I just really like the way that you present the cases with compassion and also you you tell it like it is. So I just really appreciate that. I also want to mention a case that's ongoing here in my state of Connecticut. It's regarding a home invasion turned into murder of a woman called Connie DeBate, D-A-B-A-T-E. The husband was also in the home at the time. And his wife was murdered, and he was allegedly tied up. So the police have done an investigation on the case and found out that the husband's story doesn't necessarily line up with some information they found using uh, her Fitbit technology. So they were able to track her movements somewhat. I'm not exactly sure how that all came to be, but they realized that Many of the things that he was claiming did not match, including the time of death, um, and some of her movements wouldn't be possible if things had transpired as he claimed that they did. So I just wanted to give you maybe not a case to to do on the show, but to keep an eye on for maybe doing at some point uh, a couple other items. This alleged killer husband is out on bail right now. And I believe there is some talk about a girlfriend on the side who was pregnant. So it's pretty scandalous. And I would, you know, if it appeals to you, I'd love to hear your guys' take on it. So thank you again. And I look forward to next week. Well, thanks, Shannon. So I looked this up and it was a couple days before Christmas in 2015. And a security alarm went off in a Bellingham, Connecticut house, which was a suburb of Hartford. Responders found Connie DeBate dead from multiple gunshot wounds, and her husband Rick had been tied to a folding metal chair. So this is the usual suspicious stuff, right? Right. Why would they leave him alive? Right. And yeah. A home invasion her. or whatever. Yeah. One, one person dead, one person still alive. Mm-hmm. So a year and a half later, Rick was arrested and charged with murder. There was a possible motive of a love triangle. Rick apparently had been having an affair with an old high school friend, and she was pregnant. Now, Rick claims that he was only helping out an old friend who wanted to have a baby, and he was basically donating his sperm. Oh, okay. And by what route? Was he doing that through his penis? Yes. Into Okay. Yes, it wasn't. 
It wasn't medically done. It wasn't that clinical. Okay. Uh, That's sad, though. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I look at that statement and say, what a bunch of bullshit. I know. Sure. So, and Connie DeBate's sister, in the meantime, has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Rick, the husband. Okay. So that sounds like something we ought to check out. It but sounds I, true I, crime brewery-ish, sure. It does. I think yeah. I'd let it percolate for a while and see if there's a trial and what happens and stuff. Okay, so you put that on our back burner and let it percolate? I'm going to let it percolate. All right, we have another voicemail. I got Chelsea from Bellingham. Ah. She's got a beer suggestion. One of our Bellingham people. And a case suggestion. All right, here we go. Hey, Jill and Dick. This is Chelsea. Um, I live in Bellingham currently. I have heard a couple recent messages from some lovely uh, fellow Bellingham people. Anyhow, I really adore your podcast and was turned on to it by a fellow co-worker nurse of mine. And um, I was actually calling in because I have both case recommendations and a beer recommendation. There is some fantastic breweries here in Bellingham. Um, I guess Aslan has a good sour beer, their Disco Sour, that I really love, Aslan Brewery, um, like the Lion from Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Uh, that if you did choose to do a Bellingham case, I'd be happy to get you guys some of that beer. Um, but the case I wanted to recommend is actually an Alaskan case. I'm from Alaska and originally, and there is a recent case of, uh, a young kid that got murdered in Anchorage in, uh, or actually in the Valley, Wasilla Palmer area in, um, 2016, the fall of 2016. And it actually turns out he was about 15 or 16, I believe. And he was actually murdered by a bunch of other young boys that were maybe trying to emulate some gang members or not entirely sure, but um, pretty gruesome, pretty sad, pretty awful. The uh, trials are still going on. I believe there's five or six other boys that are charged with the murder of him, David Grunwald. There's a lot of information online. Um, very sad, but... Uh, a good case, and I think it would make a nice case for you guys. Um, just wondering how these kids went so wrong, and now they're all going to be on trial for murder as adults, I believe. So anyways, um, I, again, love listening to your podcast, and I appreciate all the work you guys do. I hope you're enjoying your new home in Arizona, and uh, it'd be fun to have an Alaska case, because I don't think you guys have done one, or at least not that I've heard. I've been we going back through no. some older episodes catching up, but I don't think I've listened to an Alaska case yet. So, I also have brewery recommendations for Alaska, too. If you did choose to do that, I'm happy to give you some of those. So, uh, you guys have a wonderful week, and I will talk to you, or, well, I probably won't talk to you soon, but uh, (laughs) I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, you can talk to us anytime. Yeah. We love hearing from you. We do. And especially when they throw in a beer suggestion. Yes. Although, I can do that first. The only Aslan beer I've had is the master of karate. I haven't okay. tried any of their sours yet, So, but that's something to look forward to. I love sours, yeah. So in regards to the crime that Chelsea was talking about, the little bit I got was that David Grimwald, who was 16 years old, went over to his friend Eric Amendinger's house to smoke pot and drink. And then another friend named DJ joined them. And we're, I'm not totally clear on the events that followed, but ultimately... David got pistol whipped, marched into the woods, and executed. Wow. So Amendinger has been arrested and charged with murder, and he's also implicated two other boys named DJ and AB. That's really scary. So there's at least three trials. And there's no motive for the crime other than Amendinger said Grunwald smoked all my pot. Well, wow. that's, that's a reason to kill somebody, right? That's crazy. Smoke my weed. That is crazy. So that's that case. I think, like the other one we talked about, I think that's something I would say, let's see how the trials go and revisit it. Yeah, I'd like to see what else is to that. That just seems like a very pointless crime. It does. And Chelsea's right. We haven't done an Alaska crime yet. Okay. I know that because I got a lot of good Alaska beers. Oh, you do? That are just waiting to be spoken of. Okay. What's the plan then? So let's check this out. Let's keep track of that one. All right. And we have one more voicemail, and then we'll get to emails. One more from Emily. Also from Bellingham. I know. We must own Bellingham. Well, 
They love us there. <laughs> Here we go. Let's listen. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm from Bellingham, and I was inspired to call because everyone else from Bellingham is calling in. You have a lot of listeners here, and we all think you're super awesome in relationship goals. Um, I'd like to suggest the Ed Kemper case, and I know you guys don't cover a lot of serial killers, but it's an interesting case, and um, I never heard of it on any podcast until I saw it on the Netflix show Mindhunters, so that's an interesting case. He's a serial killer whose first victims were his grandparents. And I would suggest a beer from Bellingham because we have tons of breweries here. Um, and one good one is called Menace. And you guys might want to review some of their beer. Okay, have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Emily. I really liked the Whitney Houston in the background. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So Ed Kemper, we know about Ed Kemper a little bit. Yeah, because we watched the same TV show. Mind Hunter. Mind Hunter. Yes. Yep. Well, a little bit about Ed. He was an American serial killer who killed 10 people, including his paternal grandparents and his mother, and he regularly engaged in necrophilia, and he claimed to have consumed the flesh of at least one of his victims, but later he said that wasn't true. He was born in California. He had a disturbed childhood. He moved to Montana with an abusive mother before returning to California, where he murdered his paternal grandparents when he was only 15. He was subsequently diagnosed by court psychiatrists as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, and he was sentenced to the state hospital as a criminally insane juvenile. During his time in the prison, young Ed was a model prisoner, even assisting in creating tests that the prison would use for psychological testing of the inmates. During this time, he managed to memorize the correct answers to at least 14 different tests so that he could easily test as a sane, healthy-minded young man. He was released at the age of 21 after convincing psychiatrists he was rehabilitated, and he was regarded as non-threatening by his victims. He targeted young female hitchhikers, and there was a killing spree where he lured them into his vehicle and drove them to secluded areas where he murdered them before taking their corpses back to his house where he decapitated, dismembered, and violated them. He preferred the term humiliated in regard to his post-mortem activities with the corpses. At the climax of his killing spree, Kemper murdered his mother and one of her friends before he did turn himself into the authorities. He was found sane and guilty at his trial back in 1973, and he requested the death penalty. However, capital punishment was temporarily suspended in California at the time, and instead he received eight life sentences, which would run concurrently. Since then, Kemper's been incarcerated in the California Medical Facility. He's well known for his large stature and his high intelligence. He was six foot nine inches tall. That just makes him sound like scary. No kidding. Scarier to have six, someone nine, that big. Two fifty. Yeah. 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 With an IQ of one forty five, which makes him all the more terrifying. I mean that gives his victims little chance to have survived him. So I know we don't do a lot of serial killers, but we did do Ted Bundy. We did the Green River Killer. And I think that Ed Kemper is definitely worth doing, in my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I think we should put him on our radar. I think there's so much psychological stuff there that it's worth an episode. Definitely. So that does it for our voicemails. We also have some emails. Some emails. I have one from Anna T. with a comment. I just looked Donnie Red up. He was found guilty last month of murdering his 19-year-old wife, 42 years later after the fact. Picture shows him being wheeled into the courthouse because his lawyer says he has cancer. Laugh out loud. Well, for people who haven't heard this episode, Donnie Rudd was this guy who really was conniving. Yeah. Yeah. One could say. And we do believe that he killed his 19-year-old wife, but he was also well known for pretending to have cancer and different things. And just manipulating like crazy throughout his life. There was actually a book that was written by, was it his stepdaughter? Yeah, a family member. Yeah, I believe it was one of his stepdaughters. So he's 76 and he was found guilty of killing his 19-year-old wife a long time ago and setting it up to look like a traffic accident. The death in 1973 of 19-year-old Noreen Kumeta Rudd was first considered to be the result of a car crash which is kind of outrageous when you look at the evidence because it was clear that the crash wouldn't have caused her to fly out of the car and hit the rock. 
He actually had hit her in the head with a rock. But they think that the motive was that he was feeling financial pressure and wanted to collect the more than $100,000 in insurance that he had out on her. The case wasn't reopened until 2013, and he was arrested in 2015. And here's how it unfolded. Though he was living with another woman and her four children, 31-year-old Donnie Rudd, a lawyer and a school board member, abruptly announced he was marrying a 19-year-old, and that was Noreen, after meeting her at Quaker Oats in Barrington, where they both worked. Less than a month after their wedding, the Rudds were driving back to their Hoffman Estates home from visiting her mother when their Pinto wagon ended up in a field in Barrington Hills with Noreen fatally injured. Donnie Rudd told police, who found him cradling his wife in the front seat of the car, that another driver ran him off the road and that Noreen was thrown from the car and hit her head on a rock. She was pronounced dead, where the emergency room doctor said she had a broken neck but they didn't do any x-rays, according to his testimony. Noreen was buried in her wedding dress days later, and Donnie Rudd received $120,000 in life insurance. After that is when he married Diane Hart, the woman with whom he was living up until the day he married Noreen. This was his third marriage, and he had four children with his first wife, Luann, before he married Noreen. He worked as an attorney for a Chicago firm specializing in laws relating to the condo market, real estate, and becoming well-known in the field. But some clients began to complain of his practices. One of his legal clients, who authorities said had threatened to file a complaint about him, was shot to death in her home, and that crime remains unsolved. Then he was facing several misconduct accusations by the state's attorney disciplinary board. Well, and there's, there's a strong implication that Rudd was involved in Loretta's death. Yeah, the, oh, the woman who was the shot. The woman who was threatening to file the complaint. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he hasn't been charged with that. No, but At she was point. about to file a complaint on him, and she he had was. visited her, so yeah. But I won't go through it all, because we did do an episode on it. If you haven't heard it and you're interested, it's called The Unraveling of Donnie Rudd. Yeah, it's interesting. Now well, he's convicted. Of that one. Of that one. I think he's going to get charged with the other one, too. Probably. He'll, he'll spend the rest of his life in prison, I believe. He will. Yeah. He's old now. Yeah. Okay, I got another email from Cassiopeia84. She has a comment for us. Okay. And this is about the Jodi Arias story. Oh, all right. Cassiopeia says that some important details that led to premeditation were left out in the podcast. The third gas can that she brought in Salinas and claimed she returned, but people managed to find she still had it. Then there was a less conspicuous white car that she wanted instead of the red one she got and the inconvenient place she got it from. And then the upside-down front license plate she got caught with in West Jordan while visiting Ryan and so on. Okay, wait a minute. So the car that she got, she had the license plate on upside down. I know she went to visit this other guy, Ryan, but she's saying the prosecutor, Juan Martinez, proved that she had that. Right. Okay. I don't know how much we were talking about premeditation or not. I don't know. But I think that Cassiopeia's point is that these things prove premeditation. So that's an interesting thing to add to the story. I wouldn't discount premeditation. No. I didn't think she was nuts enough to decide this is what she's going to do. It was premeditated. Oh, I believe so, yeah. I think that it was premeditated to the point where... If she got there and he changed his mind and said he wanted to marry her and he loved her and everything, she probably wouldn't have killed him. Well, yeah. But once she realized she was just going to be a good time, that he just wanted to have sex with her, she went into a rage. And she killed him. And she killed him, which she planned that she might do. Right. The way I see it. She was prepared to do it. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Cassiopeia. Thank you. So then we have a case suggestion from Sharon F. Sharon says, I would love to hear you cover Joe Clark from Wisconsin. Medical topic related to a budding serial killer would be a great one for you guys. And we settled here because beer. So take your pick. Joe Clark was a 17-year-old male who was convicted in 1997 of attempted murder and first-degree murder. He abducted and killed teenager Chris Steiner in 1994. One year later, he abducted Thad Phillips. Clark took Phillips to an old farmhouse where he tortured him by breaking both of his legs. Somehow, Phillips escaped. 
In a search of the house, police found evidence of other future crimes. Clark was tried first on the Phillips case and pleaded no contest to attempted homicide. He was sentenced to 100 years in prison. Next, he was tried in the murder of Chris Steiner. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, plus another 50 years. So I guess he's not ever getting out. No, and I think Joe Clark is one we've talked about before, maybe? Sounds familiar. We have. That's a suggestion we'll keep. Thank you, Sharon. We like that. And there's one last email. You want to read it? Yeah, this is to answer a question. Margaret from New Mexico. And we posed this question a couple episodes ago. So Margaret says, I love your show. I'm a criminal defense lawyer in New Mexico, and I'm writing to answer your question about why jurors don't always get multiple options for verdicts in murder trials. Okay, so we were talking about how come in some cases the jury can say first-degree murder, second-degree murder, manslaughter, or in other cases you either get first-degree murder or you have to or you acquit, acquit them. Yeah. Right. And so she's answering that for us. So, yeah, because she's an attorney. Right. So Margaret says that the attorneys in the case request the court to instruct the jury on each party's theory of the case. Frequently, the lawyers will want options for the jury to choose, but sometimes they will not. It's a strategic decision for the lawyers to make. Then the court gets to decide if the lawyers have a basis for the instructions they want, but the court cannot force the lawyers to give all options to the jury. This so, does help. So it helps a lot. So now we found out how you can arrive at verdicts that seem kind of screwy because <laughs> you, you don't have a choice. Right. Yeah, because sometimes you hear jurors say, well, we had no choice but to acquit because right. we couldn't prove premeditation. Right. We didn't have an alternative. And I guess in that case, the lawyer decides they only want first degree because they don't think that the jury will acquit, I guess. Interesting. Thanks a lot, Margaret. Yeah. All right. So that's it. Yeah. Let's, let's do wrap this it up. next week. Want to do it again next week? Okay. Come to the quiet end with me. I will. I'll show you a good time. All right. You bring the beer. I'll bring the beer. I'll bring the smile. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you next week at the quiet end. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.